Good morning, folks, and welcome to Defense of the Faith Ministries ongoing series on Roman Catholicism and its fidelity to the written Word of God, or perhaps I should say infidelity. Now we've gone through three or four parts so far in this series, and we're going to take a little break this time, and we're going to go into a subject that I feel is of tremendous importance within the scheme of eschatology, which is last time events, and of course apologetics, which is defending the faith. We're going to talk about the Pentecostal uh, slash charismatic movements that are so prevalent today in professing Christianity. We're going to do this because there, I believe there are four major, at least four major elements in this last time or in times church that's going to or religion that's going to be run by the false prophet under of course the auspices of the beast the false the antichrist and we're going to list briefly those four elements today and then we're going to discuss this one element of this spiritual recipe for disaster which is the pentecostal charismatic movement now let's just take a look briefly at these four elements, and this is something of my own opinion. I can't prove this, obviously, but it's what I really feel. I believe there are going to be four elements, and these elements would be the Roman Catholic Church, or some semblance of the Roman Catholic Church, because it has the tradition, it has the wealth, it has the organization, and the framework within which this one world religion is going to have to operate. So we have the Roman Catholic Church. Another element, I believe, would be spiritual apostasy. We can see that it's running rampant within professing Christianity today with this emergent church philosophy, the uh, Catholic monistic uh, mysticism that's prevalent even within so-called evangelical circles. So we have the Roman Catholic Church, we have this major spirit of apostasy. The third would be this tsunami, this wave of ecumenism, which is, can't we all just get along together? It's, you know, diversity. It's in the essentials, you know, unity. In the non-essentials, liberty, liberty. Or, and in the, the, the essentials, of course, unity. So what we have is this tremendous ecumenical push among even evangelicals in today's professing Christendom that is drawing everybody together, Roman Catholics, the apostate Protestant denominations, as well as the so-called evangelicals. And finally, they have the Roman Catholic Church, the spirit of apostasy, this ecumenical tsunami, and then the final, I think, ingredient would be the Pentecostal or Charismatic movement. And I believe that this is going to be the catalyst or the glue that transcends all of these other elements and brings everyone together. Because you have Roman Catholic Charismatics, you have uh, Protestant mainline denominational uh, Charismatics, you have so-called Evangelical Charismatics, and all of these are coming together within this spirit of Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement. Uh, certainly with Christian contemporary music at, at the very top of this movement in drawing everybody together. So let's then today start with part one and hopefully it'll, God willing, be a three or four part series on Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement. Let's, movement. Let, let's see how valid this is uh, when we look at what the Bible has to say. What does the Bible say? Five words we always use. So let's do this now. The view that tongues is a gift for every believer and that it's to be exercised today, this has been an integral uh, part of the Pentecostal movement from its very inception. Now, tongues speaking to most Pentecostals and Charismatics has a threefold purpose. First, it's, the first purpose is that it's a sign 
uh, of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this sign would be obviously to the believer or the speaker in tongues, and certainly to those around who viewed this phenomenon. The second purpose would be that it's a means whereby God is communicating to his church through the interpretation of these alleged tongues messages. And the third purpose, the Charismatics and Pentecostals would say, is it's a private prayer language whereby the user actually um, edifies himself. Now, under this category, this private edification is said to produce a wide assortment of benefits, including encouragement during times of trial and tribulation, physical healing, spiritual guidance, and even a sleep aid. I guess you don't need your sleeping pills any longer. Just go to bed, start mumbling in unintelligible sounds, psychobabble, and you'll be right to sleep, I guess. Actually, I've had an experience in that category, and sometime during this series, God willing, I'll, I'll relate some of my experience within the tongues movement. All right, let's consider then some quotes from Pentecostals and Charismatics to sort of lay the framework for this study to see what they actually officially have to say about it. This quote, the distinctive doctrine of the Pentecostal churches is that speaking with tongues is the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this article of belief is now incorporated in the official doctrinal schedules of practically all Pentecostal denominations, unquote. And this is a quote from Donald G., and his book is Now That You've Been Baptized in the Holy Spirit, 1972. Well, another quote. God took the baptism in the Holy Spirit out of the theoretical by giving the believer an, an, an undeniable physical evidence that the believer was filled. That evidence is speaking with other tongues. The fact is that those who receive the gift of the Holy Spirit will speak in tongues. And this quote is from Charles Crabtree, how practical is the Pentecostal lifestyle? Questions and Answers about the Holy Spirit, 2001, page 70. Now, this Crabtree is the Assistant General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God denomination or grouping of churches. But interestingly, note that he uses the terms baptism in the Holy Spirit and filling of the Holy Spirit synonymously. That's interesting. We'll have to go into that a little bit later. Speaking in tongues is always manifested when people are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And this is Kenneth Hagin Sr. concerning spiritual gifts, 1974, page 89. Well, let's, um, let's go forward here and talk about Mr. Pentecostal. In his autobiography, David Duplessis, who sometimes has been called Mr. Pentecostal, said that God showed him that tongues was a means of determining the divine will. He says this, the light clicked on and I was speaking to God in tongues and he was speaking back to me in my mind. I began to find beautiful revelation that way. Praying in tongues pro proved to be a wonderful step in working my way out of such an impasse. I assume he means not being able to reach a spiritual decision about something. I would merely pray in tongues, and if the idea held firm, then I knew it was real. Wow, if that's really experiential, folks. And this is from a man called Mr. Pentecost, pages 76 through 78. Well, a bit of a qualifier. We would note that some within the broader charismatic and Pentecostal movements today would de-emphasize tongues as a sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, one former charismatic wrote this. James Robeson and others came up with the idea that you could be baptized um, in the Holy Spirit, which would be the second uh, experience after salvation, 
and demonstrated by another sign gift or even by, a, by the fruit of the Spirit, which would be especially love in this case. And that was a much more commonly held belief in the Pentecostal charismatic churches that we attended outside of the Assemblies of God. And this is a quote from Dave and Tammy Lee, former Pentecostals, March 31st, 2006. Well, the sign aspect of tongues uh, is less widely held today than it was before the onslaught of this charismatic movement, which actually began in the early 1960s. And so while the following study that we're going to do, of which this is part one, of the Pentecostal charismatic movement as a whole, now not every part of this would be applicable to every Pentecostal charismatic church uh, within the movements. So we're talking about the general position of the Pentecostal charismatic movements and the churches. All right, we've got a little background done. Let's take a look then at why uh, we reject the Pentecostal doctrine of tongues. So we're going to give a summary of why defense of the faith ministries must reject the Pentecostal charismatic doctrine of tongues. Now, I'm sure that there are going to be some details um, pertaining to tongue speaking that we just simply can't understand today. The reason is because the legitimate gift of tongues hasn't been practiced for nearly 2,000 years. And there are a lot of things in Scripture like this. Let's give an example of something else. We know almost nothing about the operation of the Urim and Thummim. For example, even though it's mentioned in seven passages in the Old Testament. Now we do know this, that it was something that was kept in the breastplate of the high priest. And Exodus 28.30 tells us this. And it was the means whereby the priest ascertained God's will. And this is found in uh, Numbers 27, uh, 21, and 1 Samuel 28, verse 6. Beyond this, we know almost nothing. We don't even know what the Urim and Thummim look like. And we don't know how they were used to determine divine direction. Since the Urim and Thummim are not in operation today, it's enough to believe what the Bible says about them and to draw a general spiritual application from what the Bible says about them to our particular time. Quote, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And this is Romans 15, 4. Well, this is the situation that we face today in regards to tongue speaking. Even by the late 4th century, the preacher John Christendom, uh, 347-407, made this comment on 1 Corinthians 12, 14. He said this, quote, This whole place is very obscure. But the obscurity is produced by our ignorance of the facts referred to, and by their cessation, being such as then used to occur, but now no longer take place. And this is from the homilies on 1 Corinthians, volume 12, the Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers. Well, thus far there are some questions in regard to tongues that I can't answer, and I don't even purport to be able to answer them. I don't believe that I'm obligated to answer every single question, and here's why. We're obligated to form our doctrine on this subject of tongues, or for, for that matter, any other biblical issue, upon the teaching of the clearest scriptures available and the more obscure ones, the more difficult ones, will take care of themselves. Now, the false teacher takes a position diametrically opposed to this. 
he will build his pet doctrine upon the relatively obscure and difficult scriptures, while ignoring almost entirely and even overthrowing the clearest ones available. For instance, the charismatic will hang his doctrine of a private prayer language composed of unintelligible mutterings upon 1 Corinthians 14, 15. Even though that's a doubtful interpretation at best, while ignoring the clear teaching of Scripture that tongues were real languages that were supernaturally spoken as a sign to the nation Israel. Well, major point then, number one. Biblical tongues were real, earthly languages. This is a foundational fact, folks, about biblical tongues. They were real languages, not some sort of unintelligible muttering or psychobabble. We, we draw back to the law of first mention. Now remember those of you who were with us during our 10-part series on Bible prophecy. We spoke how to correctly interpret Bible doctrine or Bible passages. And we did a study on the exegesis process. And one of the things we learned about was the law of first mention. And it's a very important part of Bible interpretation because it actually means the first time you run across a particular uh, issue, the way that it is interpreted that first time, it extends to the additional times you may find it. In Bible scripture. So, under this precept, we see the exercise of tongues in the New Testament the first time in Acts 2. Well, what do we see there? Well, we see that the gift of tongues was the miraculous ability to speak in a language that one had never learned. Okay, the Bible says this, Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together, and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are, these, are, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthenians and Medes, Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, and Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, and Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and the parts of Libya, Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. This is found in Acts 2, verses 6 through 11. Well, there are at least 14 or 15 different languages mentioned here. These were normal earthly languages spoken by men in that day. And the Jewish disciples were able to speak in these languages, even though they were not their native tongues, their native languages. They had never learned them and had never spoken in them before that time. There is absolutely no reason to believe that the gift of tongues mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 14 is any different from that mentioned in the book of Acts. In both places, the tongues involved were earthly languages that one, the speaker, had never learned. Well, the same Greek word, glossa, is used for both of these particular instances. The word refers to tongue itself, uh, Mark 7.33, or to a language spoken by the tongue. Well, that's point number one. Major point number two, biblical tongues were a sign to Israel. Another foundational truth about biblical tongues is that they were chiefly a sign to the nation Israel, that God was extending the gospel to all nations. Note the following teaching of the Apostle Paul that he gives to the church at Corinth. He says this, 
<clears throat> Quote, Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believeth not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. 1 Corinthians 14, 20 and 22. So, tongues are a sign for non-believers. Prophesying is a sign for believers. Let's look at the context here in how Paul is giving this message to the church at Corinth. The Corinthians were abusing their spiritual gifts, and they were particularly in love with or enamored with the gift of tongues. As spiritual infants, 1 Corinthians 3.1, they were showing off to one another. Paul tells them to stop, de cease, cease being children, and to be men by understanding the true purposes of tongues. It was a fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah 28, 11 and 12 that was directed to the Jews. Quote, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing Yet they would not hear. Isaiah 28, 11, and 12. The miraculous tongues was a sign to the unbelieving Jews that God was speaking to all nations of men and calling them into one spiritual body consisting of both Jew and Gentile. The term this people refers to the Jewish nation to whom the prophet Isaiah was speaking. Each time we see the gift of tongues used or exercised in the book of Acts, Jews were present. Acts 2, 6 through 11, 10, 46, 19, verse 6. On the day of Pentecost and in Acts 19, it was the Jews themselves that spoke in tongues. Ferdinand Legrand, a former Pentecostal and a writer of a number of books on this subject, makes this important observation. He says this, quote, It's worth noting that wherever the sign appears, it is always in the presence of Jews. And where we do not find Jews, as in Athens or in Malta, we do not find the sign. It's in the very nature of the sign that we find the nature of their unbelief. The sign denounced or corrected their lack of faith concerning salvation of those who spoke languages that were foreign to their own, that is, the Gentiles. But this was precisely what the Jews did not want to believe. In fact, they were, the Bible says, quote, contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. 1 Thessalonians 2, 15 and 16. The idea now of being made one with foreigners was more than the first century Jews could stand. That thought alone was enough to fire up their Hebrew atavism. Yet that was the first thing they had to understand and finally admit. So God gave them the best sign possible to make them understand what they could not or would not believe. He miraculously made Jews speak in the languages of foreigners in, and in so doing he put Jewish praise in these pagan tongues. Any simple but attentive reading of the Bible would reveal the scenario of fierce Jewish opposition 
towards everything that was not specifically Jewish. For instance, we see Jonah, uh, who hates the men of Nineveh to the point of disobeying God. In his frustration, he even goes so far as to ask for his death. He says this, If Nineveh lives, may Jonah die. This spirit of Jewish opposition and unbelief was only reinforced over the centuries. The Jews belonged to Yahweh and Yahweh to them in a closed circle of bigotry. Everyone else is cursed. Well, even daring to suggest that people with a tongue different from their own could benefit from the goodness of God was to risk one's very life. They led Jesus to the top of a hill to throw him off because he had just stated this, quote, Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And he fouled and added to their immense wrath by saying this, Quote, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisus the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And that's found in Luke 4, 25 through 27. This was, in their eyes, more than enough to deserve death. What a narrative we have in Acts 22. The prisoner Paul stands on the steps of the fortress and he motions to the crowd with one hand to be able to speak and as he begins in Hebrew silence falls upon the crowd but at the very instant he starts and he said unto me depart for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles the sentence freezes midair they listened as far as the word Gentiles or nations. And then they began throwing dust into the air and shouting, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. What made them explode like they did? Simply the idea that God could also be, their God could also be the God of every other man and tongue. So now it should be getting a little easier to understand why speaking in tongues is the sign of this great truth for this people, the Jews. It was also the means of access to that truth. They alone had to be convinced to abandon this particular unbelief and to consider no longer impure the people and the languages that God considered pure. Language is pure enough to be spoken by His Holy Spirit. This sign in foreign languages, like the triple vision of Peter, taught them that salvation was, quote, for whosoever, unquote, for all flesh, for every tongue. But who? in today's church, composed of peoples and tribes and nations and languages, who still needs to be convinced by a repeated sign that the Spirit of God is poured out on all peoples, nations, tribes, and languages. It's impossible to have a correct doctrine of tongues without understanding that it was a sign to the nation Israel of a new thing that God was doing, which was extending the gospel to all men and bringing both Jews and Gentiles into one new spiritual body. The need for such a sign ceased entirely in the first century. By 70 AD, Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Roman armies, led by the Roman general Titus. 
And the Jews had been scattered to all the nations. By then, Gentiles had come to Jesus Christ by the tens of thousands, and Gentile churches had been established throughout the Roman Empire. The purpose for the gift of tongues as a sign to the nation Israel had ended. Israel had rejected the sign, and she had been judged just as the prophet Isaiah predicted and prophesied. Quote, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. But the word of the Lord was unto them, precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. Isaiah 28, 11 through 13. Isaiah not only prophesied that God would give the sign of tongues to Israel, but he also prophesied that Israel would reject and be judged, which is exactly what happened. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, Paul taught the church at Corinth that the gift of tongues would cease. And this is extremely important, folks. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. 1 Corinthians 13, 8-10. These verses alone should convince even the most enthusiastic tongue speaker, that this spiritual gift is not for today. This passage is talking about the revelatory gifts of prophecy, tongues, and knowledge. It is not knowledge that will cease. It is the gift of knowledge. It is not tongues that will cease. It is the gift of tongues. Well, when will these gifts cease? Well, this, the passage seems to indicate that they will cease in two stages. The gift of tongues is treated separately from the gifts of prophecy and knowledge. The gift of tongues is mentioned specifically in verse 8 and then not mentioned again. The gifts of prophecy and knowledge are mentioned in verses 9 and 10. I believe that this teaches that the gift of tongues would cease of its own accord prior to to the cessation of the other two gifts. And we can see this demonstrated in the book of Acts. The final time we see tongues speaking is in Acts 19. By that point in church history, there was no question that God was calling the Gentiles by the gospel. That matter had been made crystal clear once a sign has been fulfilled, it's foolish to continue with it. Let me just give you an example. For example, if, if, I, if I was going to meet someone that I'd never seen before in the airport, and he was flying in, and I had had an email with him, let's say, and I told him, look, um, Joe, you can recognize me by the red baseball cap that I'm going to be wearing backwards to boot. And so I go to the airport and Joe flies in. I don't know what he looks like. He doesn't know what I look like. But the red baseball cap is a sign. And so I go to the gate that he's supposed to be coming in at and he sees me and we hook up and the sign has had its purpose. It's been utilized. It's accomplished what it was designed to accomplish. It would be foolish of me then to continue wearing the red baseball cap backwards 
for the rest of my life. Why would I do this? The sign has accomplished its purpose. Well, the gift of tongues is similar. It ceased even before the events recorded in the book of Acts concluded. But the gifts of prophecy and knowledge continued to operate until, quote, that which is perfect is come, unquote. Now, that simply meant the completion of canon, the canon of scripture. It was completed. Then those two spiritual gifts ceased. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says that scripture is able to make the man of God, quote, perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, unquote. The gifts of prophecy and knowledge were used by the prophets and the apostles for the completion of scripture, and then they vanished away. The final book of scripture to be written was Revelation. John wrote it in his extreme old age in AD 96 on the Isle of Patmos, and he concluded with a solemn divine warning not to add to or take away from, quote, the words of the prophecy of this book, unquote, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. This applies not only to the book of Revelation itself, but also to the entire book of which Revelation forms the final chapter. This clear biblical doctrine about tongues single-handedly refutes all modern tongues speakers today. Well, when Charles Parham's Bible school students began speaking in tongues in 1901, or when tongues broke out, out on Azusa Street, the Azusa Street Mission in Los Angeles in 1906, what Jews were present? Had Jews been present, in what way could tongue speaking have been a sign that God was extending the gospel to all nations and creating a new body through the gospel. That sign had already been given 1900 years earlier. In what way was that sign not entirely fulfilled in the New Testament? These are hard questions, folks, and these are questions that every tongue-speaking, Pentecostal, and charismatic need to answer. If someone, for instance, would rejoin that the Jews still need the sign of tongues, I guess I would ask this, why then has the Pentecostal charismatic movements almost entirely ignored this aspect of tongues? Now, Parham in Topeka and Seymour in Los Angeles did not seek for tongues as a sign to Israel, but as a sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this saying is true for the Assemblies of God, the Church of God of Prophecy, Four Square Pentecostal Churches, Calvary Chapel, and other charismatic churches. Well, we're going to close in with a quote from Ferdinand Legrand, who is the ex-Pentecostal book writer. He says this, quote, Someone, after reading my book, said to me, For you, it all boils down to being a sign. Of course it does, Ferdinand Legrand responds. Take a signpost, for instance. You may discourse on its length and its height, its shape, the color, the phosphorescence and size of its letters, but however accurate your remarks may be, it is impossible to get around the fact that its sole and ultimate purpose is to be a signpost. And so it is with the speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit said it was a sign for incredulous Israel. In this matter, as in others, it can be seen that the rules of the game are not being followed. It's Ferdinand Legrand, All About Speaking in Tongues, page 67. 
Well, folks, that's going to be about all we have time for today. If you've missed any in the series, the 10-part series we did on Bible prophecy, or you have missed the first four or five uh, sessions that we did on the Roman Catholic Church and its fidelity to the Word of God, please contact us. You can get a hold of us at fundamentalist, lowercase, fundamentalist7, the number 7 at yahoo.com. Or you can also write us at Defense of the Faith Ministries, 6601 Cardjalo Road, Aberdeen, Washington, 98520. Well, folks, we, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, we've interrupted our series on Roman Catholicism because I consider it to be extremely important that we take the time to examine one of these key elements that are a part of this spiritual recipe for disaster in the church today. And again, those elements are the Roman Catholic Church, the spirit of apostasy, the ecumenical tsunami tidal wave, and finally the Pentecostal charismatic movements. We need to take a long, hard look at this movement because, folks, it is so critical that you understand that it is full of error and confusion. And so with that, folks, I want to thank you for being with us, and I want to always remind you to please contend for the faith which was once written and delivered unto the saints. God bless and thanks so much for being with us.